start. So, uh, Isha, go ahead. It's verse 27. To bodhisattvas who want the wealth of virtue, those who harm are like a precious treasure. Therefore, towards all, cultivate, cultivate fortitude without austerity. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Yaldea Buddha, Ashofim le Shefa Shul Tub, Kol Pogea uke Otsar Balum, Tipuach Sablanut Kapekulam le Lotina, Zeo Tirgul Shi Yaldea Buddha. Number 12. Um, so today um, we're going to keep going with absolute bodhicitta, uh, ultimate bodhicitta. And um, we're going to do these two verses that are about what to do in your daily life to remember emptiness. So I think they're really, um, really useful, really powerful, um, because they tie right into our everyday experience. And um, the previous verse, verse 22, was about um, what to do on the cushion. This is what to do off the cushion. And so um, we'll come back to the sevenfold reasoning of Chandrakirti next week. So please do read that chapter two on the object of negation so it's fresh and clear because that's the main thing we'll focus on next week. So next week we're going to use this book um, both days. Um, and uh, But for today, not. Yeah, Firas? Yeah, I have I have started uh, reading the the this chapter, and it's really complicated and difficult to un to be understood. Is it for everybody? Yeah, is it it's, the English or is it the concepts? Do you think? No, no, no. It's it's the concepts, you know. Oh, it's the concepts more than the English. I think so. Yeah, the con mm -hmm. because because he, he he's he's talking about self inherent existence and then merely imputed and then inherent existence. I, it's it's really difficult to understood. I I, I tried to start reading. I read the uh, three or four pages. Then I gave up. Um. Yep. Yeah, it's understandable. It is hard. It is hard. Um. It's, um, you know, it's a level up from the way that we have been studying and it is to push you a little bit to see if you're ready for that level of study. And if you're not, it's totally okay. Um, what I'll do when I actually present it is I'll like highlight the main sentence, you know, so there'll be the whole paragraph and the whole thing and I'll say, here is the main point. And then we'll unpack that point in a conversational way. But that whole process is going to be a lot easier if you've at least kind of scanned the chapter and you have a general sense of the layout, even if you don't understand the content, right? So even if you don't understand what you're reading, just to read it gets the words and the general idea of it in your head. And then we're going to talk about it in class. So you don't have to understand it all right away. Just get used to the words and the way he's laid it out. Yeah. 
And, um, and if it's too much, it's too much. We say um, imprints. <laughs> Yeah, whenever this happens in the nunnery, we say, oh, anyway, imprints, imprints. It'll be easier next time. Yeah, so um, because something is difficult is not a correct reason to not study it. We have to study it because it's difficult, because otherwise it will always be difficult. Um, if it was easy and came naturally, we wouldn't need to go over it because we already understood. Yeah, so, so please don't get disheartened and don't look down on yourself because this is hard for everybody, right? This content is hard for everybody. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It's really like, oh, now we're getting into it. You know, on the surface, we can say everything is empty because it dependently arises. Dependent arising is like interdependence. Sure, no problem, done, I get emptiness, right? And then we gotta leave it at that and don't dig any deeper to what actually blocks our ability to see that truth. You know what I mean? So because we're kind of content to leave it at that general, yeah, interdependence, groovy, you know, <laughs> we leave it there because that's comfortable and it makes sense to us and it can come into our daily life and it's usable, then sometimes we get a little bit um, hesitant to dig deeper. But why haven't we realized emptiness? Because actually even intellectually, we haven't quite understood the nuances. So just really, really gently, just think of it as like, um, making the field ready to sprout seeds. The seeds might not be sprouting yet, but we're tending the soil and getting air and light in there and eventually the seeds will sprout. So, um, so when we do it in class, I'll make sure to say, okay, this sentence, this is the main sentence, it means this. Yeah, and then hopefully the book will be your friend, but maybe after the semester you'll say, no, never again, Chandrakirti is too hard. But hopefully you'll say, now Chandrakirti is my friend and I will look out for teachings on Chandrakirti. And the next time I hear His Holiness teaching on Chandrakirti, I'm not going to be so swamped and overwhelmed. Um, some of you who uh, went to India with us, when His Holiness was teaching on emptiness, it might have been a bit full on. It might have been a little bit like, I love His Holiness, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, and the part of it is that we're just not used to the conversation and at this deeper level. So very gently, we're only going to spend um, one week on Chandrakirti's sevenfold reasoning and then we're going to move on and do the Heart Sutra. So anyway, if it's not hitting it, don't worry, we're not going to go over it and over it. It's just going to be one week of it and then we'll move on. Okay, so um, verse 23 and verse 24. These are the post-meditation practice of abandoning any belief in the objects of desire and aversion as being truly existent. So the first one is abandoning belief that, um, in objects of desire. The second one is abandoning belief in objects of aversion. So you're abandoning belief. You're abandoning the story. You're letting go of, um, you're clinging to it as real. Yeah, and in so doing, you're releasing the potential for afflictions and suffering to be generated, okay? So the first one we talked about a little bit, when you encounter attractive objects, though they seem beautiful, like a rainbow in summer, don't regard them as real. Give up attachment. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So when you encounter attractive objects is saying that you encounter attractive objects, Things attract you. Beautiful things, beautiful tastes, beautiful sights, beautiful sounds, they attract us, right? And it's not necessarily that bad of a thing in and of itself. And there's some, you know, momentary pleasure that arises from it. The problem is, is that we believe that they're real and then we're sad when they're gone. Yeah, that's the problem, is that in believing in the story we told ourselves, then the story ends because it must end, because it's impermanent. We have this letdown, you know? And if we anticipate something we're attracted to, then, you know, the anticipation often feeds the attachment and the clinging is even worse and the letdown is even worse. It's maybe like if you've really planned for a vacation or you've really planned for a friend to come to visit or you've really planned for something that you're really looking forward to when you get that thing that you've been looking forward to there's the immediate joy in finally it happening and very soon after is the letdown yeah very soon after is the disappointment of 
that's not exactly what I thought it would be. It's not lasting as long as I thought it would. And maybe part of your mind is trying to keep it amped up by um, telling yourself more stories about why this is good, this is good, I really like this, this is important. Trying to keep yourself stimulated in kind of the attached excitement type of happiness. But that kind, it kind of can't stay that intensified. It's, it's very much like the sugar high. Yeah, the sugar rush. It's like, yum, crash. Now I need a nap. You know, so we're, what we're looking for in, um, in our life is stable, lasting contentment that's able to ride all the waves of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral objects or environments, able to ride the waves, but it keeps a kind of balance with it. You know, they use the analogy of like a surfer riding a wave. So there's still ups and downs, but throughout the ups and downs, there's this balance and there's this flow. Rather than a big spike and then crashing and falling and then having to find your surfboard again. So this is quite interesting and we talked about this a bit, but the next one is even more confronting, I think, which is all forms of suffering are like a child's death in a dream. Holding illusory appearances to be true makes you weary, makes you tired, right? Therefore, when you meet with disagreeable circumstances, see them as illusory. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So if you were to dream that your child died, it would be devastating, right? You would be in unbearable grief. Your heart would be torn out. And then you would wake up and realize they're still alive and healthy. And you would think, oh my gosh, all of that drama, all of that tragedy in my mind, and it never even happened. It didn't even happen, but it was as real as if it happened. Do you know these dreams, you know, that we have occasionally where they're so intense that it takes you a few minutes after you wake up to kind of like clear your head and realize it didn't happen? Sometimes you can have something really joyful happen in a dream and you laugh out loud and wake yourself up, you know? There's, you know, so much happens in dreams and during the dream, it feels real. And then you wake up and you realize it isn't, but that doesn't mean the emotion or the story is any less. So what we're trying to do is to realize that in our daily life, we're attributing significance to things that don't have self-existing significance. So like drawing a frame around different snapshots in time and saying, this was an important moment, this is an unimportant moment. This is something to remember, this is something to forget. And we draw the frame around a moment in time and then assume that that is a self-existent frame. So we choose, you know, what we've decided habitually are significant times. But I was thinking about, um, like this morning, I was sitting on the couch eating my breakfast and drinking a cup of tea and thinking about the different chapters that this day will have, the different things I'm going to do today. So I'm eating my breakfast and I'm thinking, okay, first I'm going to teach cohort one and then I'm going to teach cohort two and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that. And how many millions of times have I sat on a couch eating breakfast thinking about the rest of my day? you know, like thousands of times. And I don't remember specifically very many of them. But if I suddenly decided today is significant and I drew a frame around it and I said, today is significant because the way the light came into the room, the way the birds were, the way that the neighbor wasn't using his leaf blower for once, the way that, you know, this and this and this and this was happening, that means today, is significant. I draw a frame around this morning and I remember it forever. Then I would. Yeah, and it would seem self-existent significant. Why is it more significant than every other morning and every other breakfast? You know? And so we do this with our life as we give ourselves these like peak experiences or like climactic experiences, times that we have leaned into the present enough that we remember the details after they've passed. It shows us that our mind can actually do this all the time. It just doesn't usually care enough to, yeah, to completely lean forward and remember. 
But think about the last time something you've labeled significant happened. So many details. You remember what people wore. You remember what you ate that day. You remember what the traffic was like on a day that was significant. Yeah, you know, if there was a birth, a death, or a marriage, or a graduation, or a something you've decided is a big deal, the big deal you remember, but you often also remember all the miscellaneous details around the big deal. Do you, do you agree? Not necessarily, but often you remember all sorts of minute details that on a normal day, you have no idea. You know, so I can remember what my parents wore at their graduation from university 30 years ago. I can remember what they wore. I can remember the way their hairstyle was. I can remember the smell of my mother's perfume, even though she doesn't wear perfume anymore. I can remember it all clear as day, but I couldn't remember what they wore when they dropped me off at the airport the last time. And that was only, what, a year ago, two years ago. I don't remember what they were wearing, but 30 years ago, I remember, because it's like highlighted as significant. Okay, and so what we're trying to do here is to realize that our emotional response is not a criteria for truth. Just because it feels significant doesn't mean it's significant from its own side. Just because there's an emotional response doesn't make it more real than anything else. Because we can have the same emotional response during a dream. We can have the same emotional response watching a movie or reading a book. We can have the same emotional response if we're wrong, right? If we think we see our long lost friend across the street, our heart is uplifted and we're filled with joy and then we realize, oh, it's not them, it's just someone who looks like them. But our heart response is the same. So, so seeing the illusory nature of what you've decided is significant can help you make everything significant or nothing significant, right? It's like then nothing matters or everything matters. And what we're trying to decide is what is useful. It's freeing up opportunities now to ask what is useful in terms of how we label reality. Does it make sense? So when you think of your peak experiences, part of you is just going to refuse to let go of the story of why it was important. You're just going to refuse. You're saying, no, that birth, that was a meaningful moment in my life from its own side, absolutely. And no one's saying you can't still label it significant. It's just saying not significant from its own side. Right? If the birth of your child was a significant event in the world, everyone would remember it. But really only a couple of you remember of it, right? If it was self-existently significant, everyone would know about it. It would be broadcast throughout the globe. Everyone would know the name of your child, you know, how much they weighed, if they cried or not, you know, what their hair was like. They would remember all those details um, if it was significant from its own side. It's significant to you and that's good and fine, but don't um, exaggerate because exaggerating makes clinging grasping, suffering, afflictions. So we're like landing lightly. And to do this with our relationships can be very empowering because you no longer need to be around certain people or need to be separated from others. It's not to say you don't need people, but the specifics become blurrier, right? You don't need the specific people, right? It's interesting. So when you read these two verses, what comes up for you in terms of agree, disagree, uh, how to practice, not sure how to practice? Just to say that uh, it uh, challenges um, a call to, to, uh, to uh, look beyond the emotions uh, because uh, we tend in, in, uh, in a our, I don't know how to say, our psychology to identify ourselves, okay, not with intellectual and not with thoughts, but we, we do intend to, to identify ourselves with the experience as it uh, through feelings. And then if we, if we look uh, to, to what is beyond uh, that too, 
then, uh, then uh, it's interesting to, to explore where we are in, in, in what dimension we find ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's not like we're saying emotions aren't important or the labeling of significance isn't important. It is important. It's important to show us where we grasp at inherent existence. You know, a giant emotional response shows a huge grasping at inherent existence. That's what it tells us. You know, it, the stronger the emotion, the stronger the, the volatility in particular, the more we can unpack I was really certain of my story. I had 100% belief in my story, and that's why I'm so agitated. If there was more um, spaciousness around the story, I would have a less reactive response, which is not to say you can't have joy. You can have more joy. You know, you can have joy within a grief situation. You can have joy within all sorts of situations because the mind is steady and not lost in its story. But I think, you know, if we're, if we're really looking at okay, so there was an emotional response here or there was a labeling of significance there. That's important information for us. 100% that's important information for us, especially for you guys as, as practitioners with others who you are companioning in some sort of health process, right? In analysis and whatever, as parents, you know, noticing what people choose to give significance and noticing what people have an emotional response to is vital to the work. And you're not going to say to them that significance doesn't exist from its own side. It's all in your mind. You poor fool. Of course, you would never say that, right? You can say that to yourself if you have enough of a sense of humor and self-deprecating humor, where you can say that whole story you made up yourself and now you've traumatized your own self. <laughs> you poor thing, you've done it again. You know, you can do that internally, but externally, it's, it's much more a deep listening of, what is underneath and underneath? What are they grasping at? What story have they made concrete? Yeah, because that's then the place of exploration. Iris, yeah. Because many times when you uh, when you are taught those lessons, it is it it is as if you are only have you only have to release. And they don't think it's only about releasing. It's about releasing for a moment, and then it settles down again in a different form. And sometimes, and then you again release for a moment, and, it's, and it, takes, it settles down again in different form. It's not that emotions are not important, and thoughts are not important, and all the way, I mean, it's only not holding to it in a concrete way, as you, as you just said, but they all, you still do it. I mean, that's the only way for my, for me right now to exist, I mean, to be able to be in this world. So many times it is as if you have to release everything. No, no, you don't. But you try to release for a moment, see what comes up that, as the next moment. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you still have to function in a relative world before realizing emptiness. So certainly you release and then you come back down to your story and you still believe your story, but not as much and, and the, of course and there are new stories and then there'll be a new rainbow ag again but you, you will not hold it as the only rainbow and i've thought about you know you're saying about people that you are um, attached to and you don't have to have that person right you don't have to have that person and you know many times you feel that you have to have that person but many times you feel it when you are a teenager i mean experience <laughs> helps you with that also. But any, anytime someone dies, are you... And, but, but, okay, again, again, but uh, what did you say? If someone dies, aren't you back in adolescence, just as full of grief? If someone close to me, to me die? Yeah. So exactly that what I'm saying is that sometimes you take this premise and for me, anyway, the way, the place I'm where, you are kind of oversimplifying it and make it into a caricature when you would say, oh, this, you know, like this beautiful person is going to age, etc." Of course, I'm me too. But, um, but the need for people, for example, is still part of me. And being attached is in a way my nature. It's not like when you are when you're making a joke out of it, a caricature, that you, ha you are making this person as something, you sometimes, um, um, that's the way I feel anyway, 
You sometimes um, can uh, be in, uh, איך אומרים הכחשה? מישהו יעזור לי עם המילה הכחשה? דינאל, דינאל. אוקיי. Of the way that we are, um, no, that we are, um, that we do need people and we get attached, and it's not because this person is all this that we are making out of him, but this is our, my nature, to get attached. And I do mourn deeply, and it's not something that those thoughts, things, they can help me not get attached to him in a maybe in a too simplistic way, but this will happen anyway. I mean, me mourn, if somebody close to me die, will happen anyway. And, you know, And even, I, like, even if you believe in reincarnation, you feel that you are going to be with him, so it's maybe uh, like uh, some, some kind of warms your heart a little bit with that process, but you still are not going to see him during this life. Uh, so it is a huge thing anyway. I mean, and it's not because of the concrete stuff, like the too simplistic stuff. Uh-huh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, you know, it's, it's um, provocative that you would say I'm making a caricature. I'm making things... I'm sorry. Well, right, I'm making things... Because I... I can't, I'm not going to tell you about my personal life, right? Um, I'm not going to talk about... Yeah, I could if you really want me to, but it's probably not interesting. We each have our personal experience with this. So I'm making a general statement, right? And you just have to sit with what is useful here. I didn't mean to be provocative, by the way. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. And it's, it's good to have a, a lively debate about it. But, but to just kind of step back from our reactivity a little bit, I'm not telling you to have a divorce, give up your children to an orphanage and live in a cave, right? Or, or even, and no, but, 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 but or, or being or saying that relationship is not important for me and it's not because my child is the only, is the, that prince, okay? But don't you understand the nuance, Iris? Of course. The nuance of it is important, it's just not important from its own side. Definitely. Right? Definitely. It is important, it's just not important from its own side. No, that no, 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 definitely. I'm with you about that. We, yes, I, I, totally. Where's the point of, of friction, do you think? What's the, what's the worry at the core of your question? It's not, it's not the worry, just the saying that sometimes, as I said in the beginning, that sometimes we are talking only about the releasing. Sure. And we, we are never, I mean, well, Buddhas maybe can be at the same time totally releasing and totally into everything. But sometimes we are, like, when we're talking about it, it's only about the releasing. And the releasing is, a, is you release and you, <laughs> but my, our nature is to grasp a new thing. And you release it every time a little bit. I'm not saying something else. I, I do see the importance. It's not, I'm, I'm not, um, the, the, uh, I'm, do, I do see the importance of that, of course. Look, it's, it's going to be confronting stuff. Anything about emptiness is going to be confronting because it upends your whole life and your assumptions about what is needed and what is not needed and who you are in the middle of all of it. And, you know, you do land back down on your conclusions, but the point is to land on them with space because without space, there is more suffering and more afflictions. You know, the more hardwired you believe in your story, the less potential there is for transformation. You know what I mean? So we're inviting ultimate truth into the space of our relative reality. We're inviting the ultimate truth. It's already there. It's been there already. But by inviting the knowledge of it into our everyday life, mm -hmm. The ability to let go increases, which means possibilities increase, right? So we use what's already happening. We use the fact that we have more rapport and more familiarity with certain people. We use the fact that certain personalities and certain cultural characteristics are easier for us to communicate with than others. Mm -hmm. That is happening. There's already a continuity of that. There's already... Um, that energy and flow and momentum. And that's, you know, it's useful to know that so that you know where to direct energy more efficiently. But in the back of your mind, or maybe the forefront of your mind, you're remembering, but not in and of itself. Not from its own side, of course, right? Definitely. Because it opens up possibilities, right? Which decrease afflictions, which decrease suffering. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of all of this, right? Is to interrupt the pattern of attachment. 
Yeah. Can, can I ask something? Yeah, please. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, you said that we traumatize ourselves by uh, uh, framing certain moments with uh, uh, importance and, and re-reading re them. And I think that part of our work, maybe it's not the, the right place to discuss it, but in our work, we find many times that people are actually not aware of the traumas they suffered as like babies, but they carry it inside them. And sometimes in, in our work, we discover, we, we give a, a story to what happened. And so they became uh, traumatized in a certain way. So I, I wondered how, how it can be understood together. Well, I mean, it's a good point that you're making. It really is. I mean, sometimes drawing a frame around something releases our fixation of it and releases um, the grasping at inherent existence of something else. Sometimes making a frame helps that. Sometimes the frame becomes a trap. You know, it can go either way, but what we're trying to do is expand the frame so much so that we can hold many possibilities. Take, for example, a trauma that's not remembered. Of course, if you have behaviors that play out as a result of that trauma, it's helpful to know that that trauma existed. And then often then the whole pattern of behaviors can start to get some air, you know, and start to get some flexibility and shift that can definitely happen. Then. But, you know, the whole fact of what is traumatizing to a human being is something that relates upon generation upon generation upon generation. And what is traumatizing in one culture to one tiny baby is maybe differently traumatizing to another. So similarly, if you then like make the frame concrete and say, that is why you are like this, that's too far, isn't it? But to draw a frame and say, this is a big reason, this is a big condition why you were like this, that can be very helpful. But it's so easy, I'm sure you've all seen it, where when someone identifies a big condition for a certain behavior, they can be then identified with that trauma, so much so that they never move on from that. So there's an immediate release of, oh, that's why I do that, and it's good and healthy. And then they fixate, and that becomes like a core feature of their, their personality, and now they are a victim forever, or they are a survivor forever, and that becomes its own problem, right? So it is, it's similar to what both of you are saying of, you know, there's letting go, and then there's landing again. But if you kind of lose flexibility in either side, it becomes too much, right? It then it becomes its own problem. And that's the way really all of practice is, that's the way all of meditation is, that's the way all of Buddhism is, is that you move from settling on a conclusion and then letting go of a conclusion, and then settling on a conclusion and then letting go of your conclusion. You know? And if you get stuck on either, it becomes its own issue. And it's a Buddha that can see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. Everything less than a Buddha or not as developed as a Buddha isn't able to hold them at the same time they alternate. So for us, we have to consciously make that alternation. You know, we have to consciously remember to look at both sides of the story, the ultimate truth of it and the relative truth of it back and forth and back and forth until eventually they come into alignment and we see them both at the same time, but that's going to be quite a long time. And right now, we have way more emphasis on relative truth and not even relative truth. We have, you know, patterns upon patterns of projection on top of relative truth, right? Let alone ultimate truth. So we've, we've spent most of our life trying to navigate relative truths and try to come to conclusions that will never be a hundred percent anything. You know, so we're trying to look for footholds and stability and security and relative truth, and we'll never be able to find it. But that doesn't mean that we don't have places to kind of rest our analysis for a moment. You know, it's like, oh, okay, that's why for today, for now. Tomorrow it might mean something different, but today it meaning this is a useful framework to sit within, even if it releases in a day or a year. Yeah. So, I mean, so any framework is like that, right? If you get holding on to views, that becomes dangerous. And that's said, you know, throughout all the scriptures, but I'm sure it's said throughout, 
many forms of psychology as well. Yeah. So, so the reason I'm emphasizing the ultimate is because we don't emphasize the ultimate, <laughs> right? You guys do plenty of work in the relative, yeah? Plenty of really good work in the relative, probably better work in the relative than most Buddhists, yeah? Um, but what we're trying to bring to the conversation is that kind of, I don't know, shaking us free of our conclusions a little bit, and then you can come back to your conclusions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you say, uh, you said earlier that uh, that makes you uh, think that everything is important or nothing is important, right? And it was exactly what I thought, and I can't decide which. Is everything important or nothing important? Um, I understand that nothing important or everything important to me at, at a special moment. And this is what I have to, to release. I think I get this idea, but what do you do with the importance and unimportance of stuff? Uh, I think the mere fact that there are different perspectives, and I try always to remember it, that there are different perspectives, that in itself uh, helps me to remember that it's not the only way or it's not as real as I think it is. But still, the nuance of importance of things is interesting to me right now. So could you say a little more about that? Well, it's, it's like it's, it's both, isn't it? Everything's important and nothing's important, both simultaneously, razor's edge. And the way that I, the conversation I have in my mind about it is like to say, this is important merely labeled by the mind. <laughs> yeah, so it is important merely labeled by the mind, you know, or this is important, but not from its own side. So I'm, it's like helping me to not disassociate because it's very easy to say nothing's important, therefore nothing matters, therefore why try, therefore apathy, hedonism, laziness, depression, that whole thing can play out so easily. Um, or everything's important, therefore I have to be hyper, hyper vigilant, not just mindful, but like hyper vigilant and I can't create any negative karma and I can't do anything wrong ever, even though my concentration isn't strong enough to fulfill that expectation of myself, I will hold to it as if I can because everything's important. You know, that's the danger there. So it's like, if you can kind of live in, it is important, merely labeled by the mind. You know, it's, it's most, useful when you're hooked, right? When you're hooked by something that you're sure has self-existent importance. You know, it's to let, help you let go of the hook of either side, right? So if you're going too far into, this is such a vital moment in time, there has never been a moment in time more significant than this moment of time, you go merely labeled by the mind and relax back into center. And then on those quiet days where nothing much is happening, where things are playing out in an ordinary way, and you start to think, this isn't important, this doesn't matter, to say, not from its own side, it doesn't matter, not in and of itself, it doesn't matter, merely labeled by the mind, it doesn't matter, it could matter, <laughs> you know, it could matter. So it's, it's just keeping yourself out of too tight, too loose, you know, keeping yourself out of not too tight, not too loose, Balance and pacing are everything. And you can feel it when you get out of alignment. You know, you can really feel it. You can feel it when you've become maybe inspired by a certain teaching and then you're taking it too much too strongly. Like you found a good medicine, but then you overdosed, you know? And so you think it's, this is really important. I must now always forever and ever be hyper vigilant of this and then it sets yourself up for failure and then you say yeah but it doesn't matter anything so then you don't try at all you know this happened um to one of the retreaters at a, a recent vajrasattva retreat that i led in new zealand it was a three-month purification retreat so for three months you're going through all of the negativities of body speech and mind that you've done your entire life up until this moment and then uh, looking at the patterns to see what played out in previous lives as well so Vajrasattva retreat is like somewhat confronting because you're basically just going through the 10 non-virtues again and again going 
oh yeah, no, I don't do that one. Oh wait, 1985, oh crap. You know, and you sort of remembering <laughs> everything you've ever done. But then you're purifying it and releasing it and letting it go and trying to break the patterns of it. And what happened with some of the retreaters was that that heightened self-awareness led to, um, you know, a hypervigilant anxiety of not wanting to do anything negative ever again which is a lovely thought, but unrealistic, right? And then for some, they would say, oh, well, it's all empty of inherent existence. None of it was really negative from its own side. Therefore, it doesn't really matter that I embezzled all that money, you know, or whatever it was, you know? So you can see how easy it is for us to take one side, relative or ultimate, and then use it to negate the other side. So that's the, the view that we have to try to avoid is to just keep landing in the middle way free of extremes. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's difficult. So whatever is your middle way today, you can feel it because usually you're calm. Yeah, you're calm and awake. Calm and awake is a good sign that you're landing in your thoughts a useful way. Yeah, Edna, something? Could you use the same reasoning uh, concerning specificity? As you said, it's not specific. We need people, but it's not these specific people. However, we feel that we need others to see us as specific and we need, et cetera. So would you, like the same reasoning as what you said about important? Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. And um, then you start to understand the like, quote, simpler teachings like equanimity are leading you to an understanding of emptiness. You know, they're not talking about emptiness, but they're leading you there. You know, or that um, a teaching on impermanence isn't about emptiness, but it's leading you there. You know, start to see that it's, it's all related. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, specific is interesting. It's, it's difficult to navigate this with also being really honest and clear about your human needs. You know, you know what your human needs are thus far in your mental continuum, and that if you suddenly abruptly separate yourself from them, there's going to be a backlash of some kind. To know that while at the same time trying to release that is a difficult place to navigate because our ego gets involved and it starts getting defensive about our human needs and saying, it's only right that I have this. So it's only fair that I'm like this. Don't take this from me. You're harming me. And it gets a whole defense mechanism happening. And, you know, and that's something really normal and natural, but to be able to navigate with so far, I need this, even though I know I don't really need this and, you know, I don't really need this, but I do need this right now at my level. You know, without self-deception, without defensiveness, it's so hard. Um, and to do a bad habit or a negative habit and know that it's a negative habit while you do it is, is one of the ways to interrupt the pattern of it. But we're so used to disassociating from what we're doing, it's much easier to not watch what you're doing while you're doing it. Yeah, it's much easier to binge on whatever you binge on in a sort of half mindful way and afterwards go, oh, whoops, I did it again anyway. But if you're watching yourself during the binge, you can continue to do it. And then there's some sort of circuit that gets broken where you realize this isn't actually fulfilling the function of happiness and contentment that I thought it did, that I needed to, that I assumed it had. Yeah. So, you know, these two verses, they're really saying, don't regard them as real, see them as illusory. And I think the really key piece in verse 24 is holding illusory appearances to be true makes you weary. Holding illusory appearances to be true makes you weary. Meaning believing your own story makes you tired because you have to reinforce it and reinforce it and reinforce it. And we don't even realize how much mental energy it takes to hold all the stories of why we are, what we are, why, who we are, what's around us, what it means to hold all of those stories 
actually is a piece of the fatigue in our life. So I don't know, I, this is another one I had uh, written out in beautiful calligraphy and stuck on my fridge <laughs> for many years. This one and the salt water one, those were my two, yeah. And I remember when um, Ken Sarimache taught it, uh, just that feeling of, oh no, that's so true. But you know, oh no, because the ego's going, oh no. <laughs> but then the wisdom's going, so true. <laughs> Right, so it's a, you know, in the moment of recognition, realizing, okay, things have to change, but also, good, things have to change. Yunten, maybe what you just said, that uh, in the heart of it, when we believe the self-grasping, we have to keep busy ourselves in self-cherishing in hold. In, in order to hold and to cherish and to cultivate this illusionary self-grasping uh, idea. And, uh, and I think that we all know how much energy and thoughts and time it consumes to, self, to self-cherish the wrong view of ourselves. I think this is in the heart of, of the idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly like that. And you're, you know, and the self grasping is, as you say, like held by the self cherishing, you've got this false self, and then it's like carried around by the self cherishing that says me first, me first, otherwise I will be in pain. And that very me first makes you in pain, you know, and it just becomes a vicious circle. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, dropping it and make it ordinary if you have to make it ordinary. I know sometimes when I make it ordinary, it sounds too simple, it sounds superficial, and they are simple and they are superficial examples, but that doesn't mean miss the profundity at the core. I'm just trying to make it easy, yeah. Make it easy really by thinking, what's a day where I wasn't self-obsessed? Was that a good day? Yeah, it was a good day. <laughs> you know, when's the last time you had a day just being for the other? not in a martyred way, not in a you know, self-contempt way, but just a genuinely heart open there for the other, it's a good day, you know, it works out. Sounds too simple to say it, but it can key into your memory. Your memory and your experience helps reinforce your belief in these concepts, you know, and then it makes you more curious about how to bring them further and further into you. Um. Many of the patients and people around and also myself are saying that uh, uh, after the corona um, uh, slowing down from objects in the world, they're afraid to go back to the same um, tension and uh, noise. And it feels like it's only concrete, only outside. There is little understanding that it's so much of the noise is inside and there can be a change even when, when you go back to the outer world but it seems it seems like it's just outside and not in our uh, mind it's so confusing there is going to be a jolt of re-entry you know just like when you've been in retreat for a while and then you go back to driving and buying things and talking to other people besides your family and friends. There's, there's a jolt um, unless you kind of gently ease yourself in with the same awake mind that you touched in those times of peace when things have been simpler. So sometimes, you know, you're touching some sort of clarity and peace when things are simpler. Maybe right now things are simpler, maybe they're more complicated. It really depends on our situation. But to carry the clarity into times that are more traditionally distracting for us, I think it's really useful because we also can tell ourselves a story that isn't true about our new simple life, as if our new simple life wouldn't become just as hard and chaotic as our old chaotic life if we just left it long enough. We find a way to ruin our own peace all the time. You know, we'd, we'd fill up the space you know, we'd start renovating our houses and we'd, and we'd start remodeling our gardens and we'd start doing all sorts of things to overcomplicate our lives if we didn't have to drive anymore, if we didn't have so many people. It's not like we would avoid chaos. We would find a way to complicate ourselves 
left to our own devices long enough. You know, it's what we do. But there is also a clarity that we're, you know, that we're finding in this great pause, isn't there? There's some clarity where it's like, actually, does my life need to be as externally busy as I've made it? You know, going back in, going back to normal, does it actually have to be as frenetic as it was? Are there some pieces of, of this new simplicity that I can carry out that would be really beneficial? I'm sure there are, there's tons, right? You save so much money on gas, <laughs> right? Um, I don't know what you think, but I, I understand the, the reservations or the sort of apprehension about going back out into the world. I, I'm, you know, very familiar with that feeling, you know, go into retreat hard going into retreat. The first week is hard, then the second week is less hard, then the third week is blissful and wonderful, and the fourth week is really wonderful, and then the fifth week you're starting to anticipate coming out, and then you're nervous about coming out, and then you come out and it's a jolt. I mean, this pattern of going in and coming out, I, I know very well, and I very much sympathize with, but um, the, the feeling of it will stretch to fit whatever space you give it. So the like entry, tension, settling, relaxing, normalizing, then tension of exiting, that hump will fill a one day course, a weekend course, a two week retreat, a three month retreat. It will, it will somehow stretch to fill whatever time you give it, which shows that it's not about the time. It's what our mind does. So if we're you know, having the anxiety about re-entry, all right, well, remember that there was an anxiety of entry, <laughs> you know, and everything seems scary when you're trying to anticipate too much. You know, that's the thing. Everything is scary when you're over anticipating and trying to plan for things that you don't have control over, you know, so you can plan today, you know, today is manageable. Yeah, and you can maybe plan the first part of tomorrow and that's manageable. And then, you know, have a general sense of in a few weeks, in a few months, in a few years, a general sense, but don't try to fix it in place and time because then you drive yourself crazy with possibilities. Isn't it? I'm sure this is what you're telling your folks all the time, isn't it? Just be present. Yeah, just plan what is manageable. Don't over anticipate. Yeah, because that will make us crazy. A little bit of planning loosely, sure, but not making it, don't try and make it, this is what I'll do when I get out, you know? And it's like we've been prisoners and we have a, <laughs> you know, when we become institutionalized prisoners and we don't know how to like work in the world anymore. And, you know, we do, we're competent. Yeah. Okay, so these, this is your um, thought project just to experiment with, okay? Just a thought project to experiment with, to just imagine that you are having a lucid dream. Yeah? You know that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. You're walking around your daily life. This is everything that appears to me as significant, as chapters in the day, as self-evident. This is an all an illusion. I'm just dreaming. And I can have joys, and I can have sorrows, and I can be interested, and I can be disinterested, but it's all just a dream. What happens with, a, you know, if you spend a day doing that, just kind of experimenting? Yeah, so, you know, so you still have your joys, you still have your whatevers, but you're not having so much investment in the truth of the story. It can be quite useful. So, um, Sometimes Lama Zopa Rinpoche will say, imagine that you're sightseeing your own illusion, starting with your own eye. Yeah, like sightseeing. Then there's an element of like curiosity and wonder, right? You're sightseeing, like what's over there? You know, sightseeing your own, your own illusion, but starting with your own eye, like who is this anyway? Huh, it's a funny creature, you know? You're curious about it. All right, any, um, any last thoughts or questions? Okay, don't be scared of Chandrakirti, okay? Chandrakirti is your friend, he will help, okay? And um, look, if for some reason it is just 
you just cannot cope with chapter two and you just can't, okay? This is not like do this instead. This is if you're just getting fed up, then you can read on page 33, just page 33 to 34, just those two pages, which is a summary of the object of negation. All right, thanks guys. Just take a minute, come back. Holding illusory appearances makes us weary. So let's not do that best we can. one day.